do a bit of a demo to try and show off sort of what happens if this runs successfully for you. Uh, but if you're able to connect to the internet and interested in the workshop style component, then definitely recommend following these steps, basically just pulling down Vulcanize, um, checking out the branch you've got set up for this process, and running Docker Compose up to set up your own instance. So, with that being said, I'll grab the microphone and start it. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, yeah, here to talk about Vulcanize DB. My name is Rob Mulholland. I'm a lead developer with Vulcanize. I'm also a principal software crafter at Ape Light in Chicago, and I'm a guest contributor. I have added three lines of code <laughs> to the Ethereum repo. Please use the microphone process. Yeah, bring the microphone up. Cool. Um, so, to get started talking about sort of the motivation for Vulcanize DB, I wanted to start talking about uh, sort of where are we now with accessing data in the Ethereum ecosystem. And from my perspective, there's a few things to notice. One is that you've got these decentralized applications, but largely in order for these decentralized applications to work, we're relying on centralized data, right? So here, I visited molockdao.com, and we've got a bunch of network requests going to Infura to access the latest state of the Moloch contracts. And that's pretty cool, like it works, and it's awesome that Infura provides this service. Um, but ideally, you know, we might have solutions that didn't depend on one third party to service that data. Um, so in addition to sort of centralization around access to data, another thing we've got is that we've got a lot of duplicated effort, right? So when I've spoken with people about balkanized DB in the hallway, I think one of the like most common comments I get is like, oh, that sounds really great. Like we had to build something like that in-house to support our own infrastructure, right? So um, it's amazing to me how many teams have sort of gone through this work of figuring out how to like extract data from an Ethereum node, decode it, and put it into a Postgres database. But the fact that so many people are doing it sort of raises the obvious question of like, why don't we have a shared tool set for that? Um, I did want to mention that there's a lot of teams doing great work to address these two issues, right? So the, the question of centralization and duplicated effort. We see a ton of teams out there making progress to try and improve the situation. Um, and, you know, I think that's super awesome. I'm really happy to be able to, you know, here at DevCon, like, see what other people are doing and learn from them. And hopefully we can all learn from each other. But I think the fact that you've got this many organizations all working on, like, this shared problem sort of indicates the, the magnitude of the issue and the rationale for having uh, improved tool set. So, uh, with that sort of motivation in mind, uh, the question I want to propose is, so like, where are we headed? And with Vulcanized DB, I would say that our mission is to replace the centralized and bespoke solutions with shared tooling that anyone can run. Um, and so, if we look at the, the toolbox of sort of what we've started been developing to make this happen, I wanted to walk through uh, a few different things in our tool chain that you can use like right now uh, to start spinning up your own instance of Vulcanized DB and uh, owning your own, your own data, being able to serve it for yourself. So I'll walk through uh, each of these in more detail. So the, the foundation of the process for setting up a Vulcanized DB, DB instance, we've got this header sync process. And what the header sync process does is we're basically taking block headers out of your node and putting them into Postgres. Uh, you can configure a starting block. So if you only care about a contract that was deployed at block you know, seven and a half million, then you can start syncing headers into your instance from that uh, individual starting block. And what this process will do is it'll enable you to uh, continually verify those headers at a configurable depth. So depending on what your concern is about reorgs and so forth, you can have this foundation of data that's continually being validated um, and where data that's no longer on the chain, if there was a reorg or something like that, is gonna be automatically pruned for you. So you know you have a consistent record of just like what are the headers that were on the chain. Uh, and importantly, for some of the additional tools I'll discuss, you know, we have 
foreign key relationship between this block header and all of the nested data such that you can sort of cascade remove any any data you have in your system that is a product of a header that was removed. So the, the thing I wanted to talk about today and, and the thing that the exercise will let you to run is then the contract watcher process. And so we think the contract watcher is pretty neat. Um, what it does is basically you give us a address for a contract and you tell us the deployment block of that contract and then we will automatically uh, figure out what are the events on this contract, start getting them off the chain and decoding them for you. Um, you can run the contract watcher with multiple contracts uh, where we'll create a schema for each one and a table for each event. Those events that end up in Postgres will be associated with the header such that that header sync process is going to remove stuff that's no longer valid. Um, and this, this works pretty great for um, things that are like events that are defined in a contract's ABI. Um, and again, so uh, if, if you're able to access the internet, want to set up your own instance, this, this will do that for you. This will kick off the header sync process, contract watcher, focusing on three contracts from MoLockDAO, and it'll spin up an uh, instance of PostgreSQL, which I'll get to, that'll enable you to see that data on localhost 5000 in your browser. Uh, compose and execute is a command that I want to talk about. So this is still very much in the work for us, but um, what the contract watcher gives you right is the ability to automatically look at events that are defined in the ABI. But what we found is that um, in more complex systems of smart contracts, you also got to worry about things like anonymous events, right, or custom events where the payload doesn't necessarily, like the types that you want to decode the payload into in Postgres don't necessarily match what might be defined on the API, or the topic zero on a given log event is a little bit different than what you might expect. And so our answer for dealing with that sort of thing has basically been to say, hey, you can write your own plugins, and these plugins can be used to you know, take care of that. Uh, another thing that Compose and Execute plugins enable you to do is to look directly at storage tree nodes. Um, so I'll be continuing to talk about this during this talk, but I think one thing that is really interesting that the community sort of needs to like reckon with is that right, the in order to access state, you traditionally need to run like an archive node, right? If you want to have historical state, and so uh, a lot of folks don't want to do that. They want to be able to access their data running just like a full node. And the way you can do that is you can sort of stuff your state into events, which is cool, except it means that we've just sort of moved the problem over where instead of like state bloat, or you have the state bloat, but you also then have like event bloat, right? So there have been proposals already floated in the ecosystem to start pruning historical events out of full nodes as well. Um, and the state that you get from an event isn't necessarily the state that's actually you know, what's happening on a given contract. And so one thing that we've been working on a lot with plugins that we're developing is to look directly at storage on a contract. Um, now, traditionally you're gonna have to do this with an archive node, but we've got some ideas there as well. Anyways, plugins let you look at storage tree nodes. You can automatically decode like what is the true vet value of a variable on a contract. Um, and plugins also enable you to make more complex queries, right? So in order to sort of crystallize what those complex queries look like, I'm going to bump ahead to PostGraphile. So PostGraphile is not something we built, uh, but PostGraphile is a super awesome tool, and uh, we support Benji on Patreon. I would recommend that everyone else does as well. Uh, what PostGraphile enables you to do is you just literally like run PostGraphile from the command line, and it will inspect your Postgres database, identify the schema, and like automatically make that about available to you in the browser, which is just like super sick hotness. So thank you so much to Benji. He's also super responsive on Discord. Um, we found it to be a really easy solution to sort of expose, uh, API, expose an API in the browser with the data that we have in Postgres. Of course, if you're interested, you can always you know just make queries directly against that Postgres data. Um, but for browser access, Postgres has been great. Um, some, some things to know about PostGraphile is that like, it'll automatically discover relations between your data, right? So, for example, I mentioned that events we decode are associated with a block header that exists in the database, so you can just like automatically get header by ID with the event that you're looking up and see you know, metadata about that block header if you want to see you know, what block number was it or whatever. 
Um, post graphile also exposes built-in filters and conditions and so forth, which means that uh, you can like basically apply those exact tools to your Postgres database via your GraphQL query. Um, it supports subscriptions if you want notifications about new data hitting the database. There are computed columns which enable you to like append data and custom queries, which is what I was mentioning with the more complex queries on the last slide, right? So you can, in a migration, like create a query that aggregates data from say multiple events or tables and those will show up automatically in Postgres file. Cool. So that's the toolbox, sort of like as it stands right now. Again, you can try it out, repose totally open source. Um, and uh, the thing I wanted to talk about next is sort of like what are we driving toward with our upcoming work. And so the first thing is simplifying our interfaces for plugins, right? So I mentioned that you can write plugins and they do super cool stuff, but our mission there is to make sure that in order to write a plugin that enables you to get things like storage tree nodes or uh, anonymous events, that you have to write like the minimal amount of bespoke code possible for a given smart contract. Um, another thing we're working on is client patches to emit uh, these storage diffs during a sync. So um, I mentioned that like traditionally you need an archive node to access historical state, and that's kind of a bummer. But like one option that's definitely on the table would be to enable a subscription over the JSON RPC interface that would just like spit out those diffs as they're happening. And you could even say like specifically, I only want you to publish diffs to me if they come from a given smart contract, right? So part of our sort of open source work is to figure out a way to get this done and get that upstreamed into GAP and parity and so forth, so that you can sort of plug in that subscription directly to Vulcanize DB, um, have a plugin that's parsing that data on the fly, and you can be accessing state data with a plugin that took ideally a minimal amount of code. Uh, another thing that we've got coming down the pipeline is what we call the supernode. So the idea for the supernode is that we will be automatically digesting uh, all those state and storage diffs, but also blocks and also proofs for the diffs that are coming out of a node. Um, and our goal is to publish all of that data to IPFS and have Vulcanized DB serve as sort of a filtering layer where you can say, I want to get all of the diffs from X contract and we will give you a list of contact addresses, uh, con content addresses, CIDs, and you can then query IPFS for that data and you can get the proofs with it, right? So you don't have to trust that we're giving you like the correct data or that that data is valid because you can submit that proof to your node if you want in order to verify that that data is in fact uh, what we say it is. And so, again, we think this is like super cool work. Um, hopefully you can like share a uh, Docker Compose style demo that lets you do this at DevCon next year maybe or even sooner. Um, but that's, that's some huge priorities for us. And, you know, we always welcome uh, issues, pull requests, and people think that other priorities are worth tracking down as well. So, um, this is the part of the workshop where I would be saying, like, let's go ahead and try this out. Uh, everyone run your own instance of Vulcanized DB on your machine if you have internet. We even, like, performance tested uh, a node back home that you can connect to, but I don't think performance is going to be a problem uh, with the internet issue here. So um, to walk into our stack, you know, uh, Vulcanized DB is written in Go. Go is pretty nice because it enables us to like really easily integrate with Go Ethereum for like unpacking logs and so forth. Uh, Postgres obviously talked about that. GraphQL. Um, this setup on this slide is exactly what it says on the board. But you know, try it out when you're at the hotel or home or whatever. Like, definitely interested to uh, get feedback on this. Um, so. What I wanted to point out about this setup that we're showing is our config file. This config file is 20 lines. This config file also yields parsed events from all three uh, Moloch contracts, the Moloch contract, the Guild Bank contract, and the Moloch pool contract. And to be honest, some of that data at the top, I could have put in environment variables to slim this down even more, but I just wanted to show you like everything you need to do, to do this work. So what's uh, happening under the hood, uh, you've got this configuration file, and then you're running three of the processes that I mentioned, right? So you're saying, 
I want to run the header sync process pointed at that config file starting at the deployment block uh, for Moloch. I want to run a contract watcher process with that config file. And the most cumbersome uh, command is post graph file, but that's our fault because the way that we set up these schemas for the contracts is header basically says this is a header sync process and the contract watcher that's creating this data, and then it's the contract address, right? So fairly straightforward to populate this data with any arbitrary address that you want to. You know you can point at this schema, it'll be there. There's a little W flag there, which is important, right? Like you can kick off this post graph file process as soon as you kick off the contract watcher. And with the W flag, it'll be watching your schema. So you'll see a warning perhaps that'll say like, hey, we don't have anything in the schema right now. And then as the contract watcher starts to populate that data, it'll be like, oh, okay, the schema's here. You can load it in and when you refresh your browser, you're gonna have that data exposed in post graph file. Um, so, in lieu of a workshop, uh, well, an ability to run this stuff, uh, we've got, I've got sort of a demo here. Um, so, this is, uh, this is a setup instance, so I, I did this whole thing, a uh, few steps that I'm asking everyone else to do, and um, this is the, this is the post graph file interface that we have. Um, so, Enhance graph IQL, which was a command we passed to post graph file. That means that we get a list of like all the available queries on the left hand side. And then um, what we've got in the center is you know GraphQL interface with these queries. So I've selected these two ownership transfer events and withdrawal events um, because we can see that if I ask for that, I get you know 23 events. And if we pop over to you know the main source of truth, Etherscan, we see that there is exactly um, 23 events on the Moloch pool contract. So that's cool. That lines up, checks out. Um, within these queries, we can do some cool stuff. So we can say like, I want to see the nodes, and I want to see the parse like new owner and previous owner data. And then I fire that query, and like there it is. Okay, ownership was transferred from address. Um, and I can do the same thing with withdrawal events. Um, I want to see the amount, and I want to see the receiver. And cool. You know, these amounts are weird because it's like PBM, but there's a fixed value you can divide that by to get um, something that's a little bit more easy to parse. Um, an, an easier event to look at for understanding this would be the rage quit event because they're dealing with shares right, as opposed to a monetary value. And so if I want to see shares to burn and the member address from the rage quit events on the Moloch contract, then it's like, okay, these are pretty nice numbers. And um, we can see here, we've got like 99 shares burnt. We pop over the Moloch contract on Etherscan. We see like, oh, interesting. Here's that same address in topic one. You know, it's a padded hex value. And if we decode this to number, it's like 99. This event is that event. Um, so again, you know, you're just getting like automatically decoded events. Um, I had, you know, I, I can walk through all the queries, but I think folks get uh, an idea of what we're doing, right? You're automatically getting all these events parsed into Postgres with like three commands. Um, cool. So, trying to avoid opening my email again and talk about customizing it. Um, so, you know, the idea for the workshop was like first you can run this Docker Compose that will enable you to like reproduce exactly what I just demoed. I did want to mention that that um, thing that I demoed, that database ends up being about three gigs. Uh, that also took me about 30 hours to sync on my home Wi-Fi. So continuing to work on performance, that cost is amortized over the life of your system, right? So you might have like a high upfront cost to get totally synced with all the events that have happened throughout history, but then you're going to stay in sync if you're running the process continually, you're not going to fall behind. and. Um, and yeah, that cost is amortized, which is dope. Uh, but um, what that means is that you know you start seeing events immediately for things that happened early on in the history of those contracts, but you wouldn't see all the latest ones until your system had finished syncing. Um, but if you wanted to check out some other stuff, you could write your own config file, right? So that was 20 lines to look at three contracts, but you could look at 17 contracts and more lines. That's up to you. Um, you could. 
You could run it with an address where the ABI is not published on Etherscan, right? So there's an option to supply the ABI in that config file for the contract if you're not dealing with, you know, verified source code. Um, so it's, it's not a constraint for the system that the ABI has to exist on Etherscan, but that uh, minimizes the amount you have to include in config. Um, and if you wanted to run it locally, like not in Docker, then you can, you know, do a few things that we have hidden for you in our Compose script, right? So you have to like create a database that Vulkanize can connect to. Um, we use Go module, so you have to turn that on to enable it to build. You build, you end up with your Vulkanize DB binary, and you should be able to run these things locally. Um, and then if folks were able to, you know, be like, okay, I did this, I'm bored, and I like made my own config, looked at my own contracts, I'm bored again, I'm running it locally on my machine, I'm still bored, then like option three that I thought would really take up everyone's time would be, okay, let's start building our own plugins, right? So all the plugin architecture uh, is in the library shared folder of Balkanized DB, and specifically in the factories directory, you can see we've abstracted code that will handle like the overarching process of syncing anonymous events or syncing storage diffs and you just have to write like a few small dependencies to basically tell us like okay you've given me an anonymous event like how does x become y like something that you put in the database um but yeah and you know i'll i'll stick around after this talk i would, I would love for people to to give this a go if we can um but there we are um so I wanted to say thank you. Uh, I definitely have not done this by myself. I you know, have the uh, privilege to speak up here, but Rick Dudley, Elizabeth, Andy, Gabe, Edward, Ian, Connor, Gustin have all been super instrumental to uh, getting this project to where it is today. Uh, we received support from the Ethereum Foundation, for which we're tremendously grateful, um, and also from MakerDAO. So thank you so much to those folks uh, for supporting our effort. We're really excited about, um, hopefully, a lot of value can be delivered to the community with a shared tool set for um, caching historical data. And that is pretty much what I got. I'd definitely be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. You support subscriptions on uh, GraphQL? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it's post graph file is Again, just like the most awesome of awesome open source projects, um, it, it supports subscriptions out of the box. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I was just curious uh, in the config file that yeah. you showed us, uh, uh, you had to specify an address, right? Yep. So, how do you deal with uh, some tabs that uh, essentially spawn a different contract for each individual user uh, with the same bytecode, and then suddenly now you're ending up with like thousands of addresses? Yeah, so you definitely want to like write a plugin to deal with that, right? Because um, what the contract watcher is giving you is it's giving you a upfront facility to say like, given a contract address, I want to see all of its events like decoded, which you know I think has some value on its own. But it, we're not trying to be like super aggressive beyond that with the contract watcher itself. Um, but with plugins, what you could do is you could say, okay, like given that I see this event that I want to spin up maybe a new instance of the contract watcher pointed at a field on that event that is an address that I care about, or you know, any number of ways you can implement that to, to run the process. And we have, we have code that does that. Um, some of Ian's code, Ian's, there's a couple different teams that work in both nice DB, so there's another code base that actually does that. It, it, it takes the, it will read a contract <coughs> to get a contract address and then write the decoder for that address. Yeah. A similar question is like, sometimes you want just to uh, listen for ABI, whatever address, so a typical case 7 to 1, for example, so to keep track of all the 7 to 1 token. Uh, yeah, so that's actually what I was just talking about. Yeah. It's a, it, it was an ERC20 watcher, and a, we just did an ERC20 watcher, but obviously you could change it to make it an ER, uh, ERC721 watcher as well. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, one thing just to expand on that point too. Um, you know, we've sort of tinkered with a variety of different amounts of like base data that you can scan for when you're running Vulkanized DB. And so we started off being like, let's the, just like digest everything and then anyone can run this and digest everything. But like, I think uh, reality is that a lot of people who might get value from Vulkanized DB are 
not necessarily super stoked to like pay the performance cost that it takes to digest all of that extra information if they don't need it, right? So a lot of what I've been demoing here is like a pretty lightweight process of syncing headers and syncing events from specific targeted contracts. There are more tools in the box that enable you to do more heavyweight stuff if you've got the info and the motivation to do that. Um, and we're hoping the super node can help out with that a lot too. Sorry. Well, I'll go back to you. There is another question. Okay, well then, this way. Is there a technical reason for not syncing backwards? Uh, because you mentioned that? that you start syncing from the starting block, which means it takes you 30 hours to get to events you probably care about. Yeah, um, so I mean, the, the main thing is just like, I guess uh, that the, the latest blocks are more likely to be removed by the header sync process, right? So you'd be potentially doing a lot more redundant work. Um, you can totally get around that if you're interested by starting the header sync process with a more recent starting block number, right? So I was demoing with like the deployment block as the starting block number so that you know you're gonna get like all of the events. But if you really wanted to say like, I just wanna spin up an instance that gives me like what happened the last five days, then you can pop that in as a parameter to the command, um, a block number where you start caring about stuff and then that's where the thing will happen from. Yeah, but I mean, you you care about everything. It's just that I, in the 30, 30 hours you want to do something as well. Yep. So, and you have a block watcher watching for new blocks, so your reorgs get just managed just the same way as they are right now. Yep. It's just instead of starting at seven minutes, whatever, you walk backwards from the moment you started the block watcher. So yep. Block before, block before, block before. So, yeah. So the short answer is it is technically harder to do that. Just generally, Gath doesn't like to go in reverse. Um, so I mean, that's kind of we can. If you're really curious about it, we can really talk about it. But the short answer is Gath doesn't want to go in reverse. Well, I mean that's specifically true also with like subscriptions, right? So part of the idea here is that you could easily have like a subscription to events, but then those are going to be fired as your node is like processing the blocks that it's going over. Um, so part of the rationale for the setup is like you could use either subscriptions or get logs queries to progress forward. But I do think that's a really cool idea um, and something we could totally dig into. So appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Last time I checked, you had no Docker file in your last branch. So and now I'm seeing that it is on its own branch. Is there a reason for that? Uh, is it well, stable or still work in progress? It's kind of a work in progress. I mean, we have, um, I think we had like a Docker file a long time ago and it was like pointed at rank E and we found it to be like not super useful for our day to day development. So lately there's been a lot more work on that and we have a lot of progress on an open PR. That's, I think it's called like Docker updates. Um, but yes, it's not on master yet, um, and the reason, but the reason that this one is on its own branch is because like this is pointed at Moloch, and like maybe it makes sense at some point to have like example Docker files, but we just didn't want to be like, the purpose of Vulcanized DB is watching the Moloch contracts, you know? It does a lot more than that. Yeah? So, uh, I'm, I'm curious about the limitations of the plugin API. So currently, from what I understood, plugins act as a map, let's say, so they map events or whatever to another events or whatever. Can they act as a reduce? So for example, reduce, uh, I don't know, on the database level, like, I don't know, sum up, transfer, balance, whatever, and how does it work with reorgs? Yeah, I think I'm gonna go straight to Rick on this one. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, we could be running reduce, um, but then as you pointed out, yeah, the the reorgs. The re so what you would be doing is you would we would have a, a table like we have now, and then we would just again have a plugin that read from that table and wrote a new table, and then it would know to compute the new table. So the the first table that I described would have all of the things that, that could get reorged, and then the secondary table would get recomputed. So you can write everything that I just described in a plugin because you can do all these things in plugins. Um, and that's sort of, I mean, that's how we would address that. But yeah, I mean, when I designed the system originally, I thought most of the utility would be in Reduce. Um, that's just not the way that development happened to go. Yeah. You said in your presentation that you are decoding not only events, but also state changes. Yeah. Can you elaborate more on this and show some examples? 
Yeah, so I mean, that, that's work that happens in plugins because we're actively trying to sort of figure out like how can we either do this automatically or ask you to write like the bare minimum of code that you need to um, to make that happen. Uh, but in a, in a nutshell, the way it works is that you have a mapping of given storage keys to given contract values, right? So that's pretty straightforward for static values on contracts. Like it's literally just like the index the value on the contract. So you can have a mapping that's like index one is, you know, the total supply or whatever. Um, but it gets a little bit more interesting when you start dealing with like mappings and dynamic arrays because generating storage keys for that generally depends on secondary data. So like an address to map to balances or whatever. And so um, the way that we're looking at doing that is basically you flag some events as like these have addresses that I know for sure are going to be in this mapping. And then we'll like automatically based on the index of the mapping generate the keys based on hashing that address with the index. Um, such that you can recognize like all of the storage diffs that are coming off of a contract after um, a given event has been synced. And then, you know, af after you know like what it maps to, it's a pretty trivial process of just like decoding the, the value associated with that storage key into the appropriate type. Cool. Alrighty, well thank you so much for coming out to listen to me talk. Again, um, we're really excited about this work and hope that it can provide a lot of value for the community and totally open source. So.